Quraysh in general from moving out or, or, or prospering in any way. But Uthman saw, well, this is the job of the Khalifa. This is what my job is, prosperity for the people. So let them, let them be prosperous, and this should be fine. So this was another difference, uh, you can say, in policy that Uthman had from uh, Umar radiallahu anh. Um, let me just make sure it seems that... Uh, I just want to make sure I don't go over time because I need to finish quickly. <coughs> So another difference that happened at the time of... Uh, so now, now that I've done this, I, let me just go over this. Um, another issue that happened in the time of... Now remember, Uthman is lenient, right? So when Omar did something, it was like with a, with a heavy hammer. Like you have to do it this way, and that's it. Uthman was lenient in a sense. He had liberal policies. And Omar saw, for example... And again, you've got to remember that Uthman was an entrepreneur from the beginning. He was extremely rich. He was an entrepreneur. And he saw his khilafah as a way of creating prosperity for the other people. So just keep this in mind. For him, this was like, okay, how do I bring prosperity for the other people? <laughs> for Omar, it was like, more like, oh, we shouldn't do anything to bring them closer to dunya. Right? We shouldn't bring them closer to like enjoying dunya, especially my family and especially the companions of the Prophet, right? And, and this, this is a big change in attitude, in, in administration, you can say. Omar, you know, don't like this dunya. And Usman is like, oh, be prosperous in this dunya, come on, you know? And so this attitude really had an impact uh, because a lot of companions of the Prophet... <coughs> a lot of the key companions of the Prophet didn't necessarily uh, agree with that attitude per se. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read to you a part of his khutbah in Medina that he gave. I have a translation here. Um, so this is, and the other thing that I want to make sure, uh, sure that I make clear is that Uthman was Khalifa for 12 years. Out of that, the first 10 years there was no issues. No issues whatsoever. No issues with Anybody, everybody's happy, things are becoming prosperous. But in the last two years, issues started to prop up. So now he's, he is in Medina giving a khutbah, not a Juma khutbah, but he has heard allegations against him, and he has gone to the mosque, called for an adhan, people have gathered, and he's giving this khutbah. But it really defines for you what his view of what his role is as a khalifa becomes clear. And so he says in this situation, it has come to my notice that many false things are being said against me and my administration. You know, after the Holy Prophet Abu Bakr became the Khalifa and after him Umar became the Khalifa, I served them both and they were happy with me. After Umar was chosen as the Khalifa, I swear by Allah, he says then, I did not covet this office. I mean, I was the richest person in the land. He was the richest person in Arabia. He was probably the richest person in the world. Okay? I... Uh, I did not covet this office. You know, I, all, I was already rich, and the office of caliph would not be a matter of any material advantage for me. You know, Omar was harsh and stern, and he was not hard with the people alone. He was hard with his own person. I Meaning he was hard on himself, and he was hard on the people with him. May God bless him. His services to the cause of Islam cannot be forgotten. When I became the Khalifa, I felt, I felt, that people wanted some change in policies. I was consequently, I followed liberal policies and relaxed some of the harsh measures that had been enforced in the time of Omar. I increased the stipends of the people, meaning Aisha, the person who can't see, if they get a stipend from the government, it was increased. I withdrew the restraints that had been imposed in the time of Omar from traveling, from buying, from doing commerce, particularly from the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then he says, the rule of any imam is to be judged on the basis of prosperity of the people. Look around you and say honestly whether you, have more pro you are more prosperous today than what you were at the time of my secession. Meaning within the last 12 years, were you better today or you better, better 12 years ago? Meaning in terms of material. The Muslim dominions today are much more extensive than they were 12 years ago. Okay? The Muslim, uh, the 12 years, the people are now wealthier and richer 
than what was said before. As a result of military operations, there has been much booty. All such booty has been distributed according to the formula laid down by the Prophet, peace be upon him. After such distribution, there are ample funds in Bayt al-Mal to meet future needs. He's, ask, he's actually answering an objection here. Many, uh, not many, one particular companion of the Prophet felt there should be nothing left in Bayt al-Mal ever, meaning everything should be given to the poor. And Uthman felt that no, we should have a savings in Bayt al-Mal to meet future needs. You never know what crisis we'll be in. We need money in Bayt al-Mal. So anyway... So this gives you an, uh, an idea of the type of uh, Khalifa that he felt he needed to be and the type of, as the expansion was happening, he was not only expanding Islam, but he was bringing prosperity to the people as this was happening. Like I said, 5,000 mosques, you know, trade had become more prosperous. And he made a lot of ijtihad that had to do with trade. For example, uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, because in the time of the Prophet, what was the main purpose of a horse? The main purpose of a horse in the time of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Omar was, and this will, if you think about it, it shows you how fiqh change, how Islamic law changes based upon the situation. In the time of Omar, for example, the horse was for a personal need. I go from here to over there, it's, it's my ride, right? But by the time of Uthman, when Islam had expanded so much, a horse was no longer just a personal ride, it was part of commerce. It was part of the commerce, the industry, the trade. It was part of the assets of a business person, of how he'll move his trades. So he included that. He said, now you have to give zakat on the horse, if you have, <coughs> beyond your personal horses. If you have assets that you're using in your business and they're horses, you have to give zakat on those horses. Those are assets. This was one of the ijtihad that he had made. Um, <coughs> another thing you'll find very interesting, he made an ijtihad. Very quickly, I'll go over some of them. One of the ijtihad Uthman one made was that he uh, added two adhans to the Friday, uh, Friday adhan. You know, you have adhan, generally there's one adhan. But uh, he would have one adhan being given in the marketplace. A person would go to the marketplace. And this raises an interesting question for us. You know, we also do two adhans, but we do them all in the mosque today because we have no Islamic system. But the idea was that there would be one adhan in the marketplace to tell people in the marketplace, you need to get ready for Jummah, and it's you know start time to start shutting down and, and start coming to Jummah. And then the second adhan would be given in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. This is why some scholars even today, uh, some scholars of today, not even today, of today say, there's no need to give two adhans anymore because that system is no longer there. And it's an interesting opinion. Of course, it has some validity. And so some of the brothers in Islam, or some of the scholars in Islam, they feel that there's no need to give two adhans anymore because it no longer serves the purpose that it used to serve. Uh, you know, uh, we do things because we saw others do it without realizing the purpose of why they were doing it. Um, so anyway, two adhans, he added two adhans. Uh, and I had talked about why adhan can be changed last time, so I'm not going to go into that. But uh, also another ijtihad that he made, uh, meaning in his, uh, in, his, in his khilafah, there's some ijtihads that they have been debated whether he made them or not. I'm not going to go into them. For example, the Eid khutbah, the idea that you lead the prayers first and then do the khutbah. Some say Uthman made this ijtihad. A little bit of research that I've done in the issue, it doesn't seem to be true. Inshallah, I'm going to finish the, uh, the rest of the issue on the second khutbah. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله ولكم من إسلام بسم الله إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له um, one very famous uh, work in ijtihad that he did was the compilation of the Qur'an into the same spellings, meaning the spellings of the words. Now, the compilation of the Qur'an was done by Abu Bakr, as you may remember. Even the companion, uh, you could say the compilation of the Qur'an was done by the Prophet, but Abu Bakr verified it from the house of Aisha to the people who had memorized it. But Uthman radiallahu anh put them ala rasmul wahid. He put them on one spelling, one way of writing it. Because people were 
they had it memorized and they were writing it in different ways, in different parts, with different spellings. Do you put a fatha there or do you put an alif there? You see? It could result in the same thing. But he wanted to put, whether you put a ya or a kasra, it should be all standardized. It should be the same everywhere. So he standardized the writing of the Quran. That was a big endeavor that he had taken. Um, one of the last things that I want to talk about is, very interesting, uh, is the difference of opinion that occurred between Ali and Uthman. As you know, towards the last two years of his Khilafah, when Islam had expanded, uh, he, he, people that were complaining against him, people were complaining against Uthman, you've done this and you've done this. And a lot of it was just rumors, which I can read to you the letter. Maybe I should read the letter to you just so, uh, well, let me see how it goes. Uh, so a lot of rumors were being spread about him that he's using the money in Bayt al-Mal the wrong way. Okay? <clears throat> but Uthman radiallahu anh, so because of this and because of other reasons, there was a group of people that had come, and you know how we have a protest today? Well, you could say this was not really a protest, it was more like a rowdy protest with a lot of threats. They, people had put a protest around the house of Uthman, and in the first stage of this protest, they would allow him to leave the house and go to the prayers, lead the prayers and come back. And the protest would be there. There were people from uh, different parts of the Muslim world had come there to protest against him. And he would come to the mosque, lead the prayers and go back to his house. He never stopped any of the people from protesting around his house. He never stopped any of them to protest around his house. Now, Ali felt... Again, I don't want to go into the history, but some of the ijtihads that he made was, is that everyone was telling him, remember, this is the man who is extremely rich. This is a man, he has the largest army in, in the world at this time. You know, he can tell any army at any time, look, get rid of these demonstrators around my house. But he and Ali disagreed here. Ali thought the institution of Khilafah is being attacked. The institution of Khilaf, the office of presidency, for example, the institution of Khilaf is being attacked. You need to do something. You need to bring in some guards. You need to bring in, you, you know, to move these people out of here. They're going to kill you. And Uthman said, no, they have a problem with me. They have a problem with me. It's, I'm not going to shed blood because of grievances that they have against me. I'm not going to bring in the army because they have a problem with me. I'm not going to do that. And this became, I mean, Ali was so frustrated over this issue because he really felt that this is going to lead to a negative situation, which is what happened because at, then soon after that, these protests were happening around his house. Hajj season had happened. And remember, I've already said all the companions have now left. And now whatever little was left, a lot of them have now gone for Hajj. Right? And so that's how his death occurred, basically. All the people are in, in, in Mecca, and that group was that was around him, well, now that I've touched the subject, let me tell you something interesting about this, is that it really got from the first level was where they came and just kind of like surrounded his house, and he saw, well, this is just a personal thing against me, they're not stopping me from praying, they're not stopping me from anything, it's not become a law and order situation yet, not a big deal, I'll go pray, I'll come back. And uh, I'll, maybe I will read uh, part of this khutbah so it becomes clear what people were, the rumors that were out there about him. And he would go pray and come back. And, 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 and then Uthman radiallahu anh, the second phase happened was at a Juma khutbah, he tried to address the grievances of these people at a Juma khutbah. And at that Juma khutbah, this is before the Hajj season, at that Juma khutbah, uh, a fight broke out during the Jummah khutbah itself. So, and Uthman told his people, basically he commanded the whole people of Medina, that no one is to harm these people. If they harm me, you can take revenge. After they've harmed me. But until they haven't harmed me, you have no right to stop them. And, you know, just be careful what you believe from what they're saying, etc. Et so he tried to address some of the situations. But one of them threw a rock on Uthman, and he became unconscious. They had to take him home. But the, what came out of that was Uthman, the rebellion, the rebels who were around Uthman, they became more embold, emboldened after this. Because they saw Uthman didn't do anything to us, even after we took such a drastic step. 
in the, in the Jummah khutbah. We took a, such a drastic, they didn't do anything to us. They became more emboldened. And then, so after that, uh, when the Hajj season happened, they, you know the wells, everybody's heard of the wells Uthman has bought. They stopped water from entering the house. Basically, they would, they stopped water from going into the house of Uthman radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha, she tried to intervene. She tried to get food to Uthman's house. The, they stopped that. They basically, it's like a blockade around his house. They weren't letting him come out to pray. And uh, just as a side note, uh, you know, Uthman radiallahu anh, he had a dream on one of those, the last day, he had a dream. He was fasting, because there's no food allowed to be come in. So he was fasting, and uh, he had a dream. He said, he, he had a dream, and he fell asleep, and he saw the Prophet in his dream, and the Prophet said, Uthman, why don't you do your iftar with us today? And so he woke up, and he told his wife, I had this dream, I think today's my last day. And that's what happened, is that they went over the house. Now, against his uh, strongest, sternest commandments, Ali radiallahu anh, because he couldn't do anything. Uthman had tied the hands of Ali. Ali believed very firmly that some security forces need to be brought here and made these people to disperse. Because he saw it as an attack to the Khilafah. And Uthman said, no, this is just against me. And it's personal to me. I'm not going to let Muslims shed blood because of me. And you will have to take revenge when the time comes if they kill me. And that's what happened. And so the people went over the house. Now, despite Uthman's commandments and despite his urging, Ali radiallahu anh had put uh, uh, two people in front of the house. President <coughs> Hussein, there were a few other people there too. But they went over the house, went in, killed uh, Uthman radiallahu anh. And Uthman radiallahu anh, uh, again, was not buried for many, many days. Uh, there are some s say as little as three days, some say many days. And uh, when, they, when they wanted to bury him, they didn't want him to be buried in, you know, he's buried near.